Okay, I'm Tom Garreau, president of the Global Coral Reef Alliance, and what follows is a soundtrack uh, for a PowerPoint presentation that I gave two weeks ago at a lecture at Oxford University Environmental Change Institute. The title of the talk was Saving Coral Reefs from Global Warming. Some key coral reef facts are very simply that coral reefs are the most productive, have the highest biomass, biodiversity, economic value, and beauty of any marine ecosystem. At the same time, they're the most vulnerable of all marine ecosystems to any sort of human-caused damage, whether it's direct physical damage from dredging or anchors, from cutting down hillsides and forests and letting the soil wash into the sea, from pollution, from sewage or, or fertilizers, or from global climate change. So for all of these stresses, coral reefs are about the first to disappear. They're extremely sensitive. They require the cleanest, clearest, warmest water to survive. Yet this incredible lushness that we see, it's like an oasis in the, in the, in the desert, is amazing because coral reefs occupy less than one-tenth of one percent of the area of the ocean. They contain something about a quarter of all the different species of fish in the sea and stand out in every regard. And so they're the most diverse, the most productive, the most economically useful of all marine ecosystems per unit area. This is one of the first high quality underwater photographs of coral reefs ever made by my grandfather in 1948. He, he was the inventor of uh, macro photography. And this was the first high quality underwater macro photograph. Anyway, they're exceptionally beautiful environments, and we're losing them very quickly. For more than 100 countries, coral reefs are the major source of the fisheries, the food that people eat, the tourism economy that provides most of the jobs, the protection of the shoreline from falling into the sea and from erosion, from waves and storms, and for their marine biodiversity, all the different forms of life they have. About 60% of all the worldwide losses of ecosystem services, the economic losses that people are making in the entire globe in the last 20 years, in the entire world, comes from deterioration of coral reefs alone. So that's in one-tenth of one percent of the, the Earth's ocean. So the, the losses are more than 600 times, closer to 1,000 times higher than the global average per unit area. So these are being felt by people who live in coral reef areas because they're losing all these things that they need to survive. Um, and so it's the small and poor countries that are the first and worst affected by global climate change. As I say, they're already paying for the bulk of the economic losses that are being felt worldwide. And these estimates of 60% loss of worldwide economic services are before the devastating high temperature bleaching that hit coral reefs in the last couple years, last year and this year. So this is before any of that happened. The situation is much worse now because what we've lost in the last year alone due to heat stroke. So coral reefs are the first and worst affected by global climate change, and we've already paid a heavy price. We've already lost most of the world's corals due to heat stroke. Most of the remaining reefs are very low live coral cover. They used to be almost completely covered with living corals. Now there's one here, one there. This means these are no longer ecosystems that are growing up and able to resist the wave damage and grow back. These are systems that have lost most of their ecological function. One coral here, one there. They're dying rather than growing. So, and we've done a lot of this ourselves, dredging, anchor damage, destructive fishing methods using poisons and bombs, eutrophication, that means letting the nutrients from our sewage and agriculture fertilizers run into the sea, that causes massive harmful algae blooms that smother and kill reefs. Pollution of all forms, new diseases are breaking out in coral reefs, and now worst of all, global warming is killing corals at a rapidly increasing rate. This is the first photo of coral bleaching. This was taken in Jamaica by my father in 1963. These reefs were not bleached by high temperature. They were bleached by hurricane, massive hurricane rains that washed fresh water and mud onto these reefs. But <clears throat> bleaching is a general stress response for almost any stress except one, and that is acidification. 
Every single time you see an article about ocean acidification, they show pictures of bleached corals like this. And they're showing pictures of corals that are bleached by high temperature. Yet, you can put a coral in acid seawater and dissolve the skeleton away completely and the tissue does not bleach. Acidification does not cause coral bleaching at all. In fact, if you then put the coral back in normal seawater, it will grow a new skeleton. So acidification is not a threat to coral reefs at all. High, high temperature is right now. Um, coral bleaching, due to high temperature, we've been able to accurately predict it since 1990. Um, what I found back then was that it took only one degree C above the average temperature in the warmest month to cause mass bleaching of coral reefs. It took only about two degrees C above the normal average temperature in the warmest month for most of the corals to die from high temperature. We're all along just below the upper temperature limit at which corals could stand, but we never were pushed beyond that on a large scale until the 1980s. Since then, it happens year after year, we get coral reefs that have lost up to 99% of the corals, like the reefs that I was diving on last month in Indonesia. They were beautiful last year, almost 100% live coral cover. This year, 95 to 99% of the corals died in the space of a few weeks from high temperatures. This is a, what's called a hot spot map. These areas that you see here, this is the latest one, these areas you see here in yellow are areas where the temperature is now well above the bleaching limit for corals. That's in Micronesia in the Central Pacific, some patches here in the Eastern Caribbean. We're able to map these in real time. It's no surprise when bleaching happens. We can tell when it's about to hit simply by mapping the sea surface temperature changes from satellites. We've known for more than 20 years how to do this, but governments have refused to act to try to prevent this damage from continuing long after we knew it was caused by high temperature. <clears throat> this map here shows global sea surface temperature trends. If you ask physical oceanographers, is ocean circulation changing? What they'll tell you is it'll take us 50 years at the present rate of measurements if you give us many millions of dollars for more instruments. Then we'll be able to measure if it's changing. But what we've done here is we'll simply mapped out from the satellite data the average changes in the ocean temperature. It's not the same every place. Some places are warming up more quickly than others. Some places are warming up more slowly than others. And so in this map here, I've put black dots in the middle of the areas that are warming up more slowly than average. So yellow and orange is more rapid than average, and white and bluish are, are more slowly than average. And these areas form a very characteristic zone. They form a belt right around Antarctica and then in the middle of the ocean basins far away from land. And these are areas where we know something else is happening. Wind speeds are picking up in those areas of the ocean. And the reason for that is that when global warming happens, some parts of land warm up more quickly than others. And then when that happens, that changes the pressure of the atmosphere. So what drives the winds are differences in pressure. If there's a big difference in pressure between two places, a strong wind blows. The pressure difference is small, the wind's much weaker. So changes in surface heating have been causing changes in, in wind speed. In particular, there's been a big increase in wind speed out over the open ocean. That's been documented, again, by other satellite data. And in those areas, as a matter of fact, something interesting is happening. There's more phytoplankton little tiny algae growing in the water. <clears throat> so those are these areas here, which are warming more slowly than average. Um, and these areas are really important because that's where the strong winds are mixing nutrients to the surface, and that's driving the fisheries of the world in these particular areas. Um, now, when we look at the areas that are warming up more rapidly than average, I've marked those off here with red dots, and those show a very different pattern. Here what we're seeing is the red dots are in all the enclosed ocean basins, like the Caribbean, large parts of the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal. Then we see all the areas that have strong warm currents, like the Gulf Stream or the Kuroshio. Those are warming up faster than average. The areas of the hot waters flowing from the equator to the poles are warming more rapidly than average. 
All the areas with a strong cold current offshore, those are warming up more rapid than average too. So that means the warm currents are pumping more heat out and the cold currents are warming up more quickly. They're delivering less, they're flowing less as a result. And then we're seeing areas warming up more quickly than average are the areas where almost all our open ocean fisheries comes from. It's about 90% of our fisheries come from coastal upwelling zones where the winds are blowing the surface water away, drawing up very cold, nutrient-rich deep water and causing intense phytoplankton blooms. And that causes intense fisheries off Peru and South Africa and other places in the world. Those areas are all warming up more rapidly than average. That means the warm water at the surface is becoming so thick and so warm that the cold water with the nutrients can't get to the surface anymore. And that means that in these areas, which are critical for our fisheries, the fisheries are collapsing from the bottom up due to lack of nutrients coming up. At the same time, they're overfishing them from the top down. So double whammy. The result is, by studying these maps of temperature change with satellite data, we're able to see global changes in ocean circulation happening in every part of the ocean. And they're not warming up at the same rate every place, and that's very important because the local rate of warming may be different than the global average. And so these areas here are areas actually where the most coral reefs are, unfortunately. So, the areas that are affected include almost all coral reef areas and island nations. And it's going to affect the open ocean fisheries as well, as I say, because of the lack of nutrients coming up in most of the ocean. Now, the solution I'm going to show you here is something we call bio-rock technology. And this was invented by an architect named Wolf Hilberts in order to grow building materials of any size or shape in the sea with very small electrical currents applied to the ocean, and with that, he calls electrolytes of the water and minerals grow out of the water. It won't happen naturally. These minerals are limestone minerals. The same minerals that corals use to make their skeletons, the same minerals that the pyramids were built from thousands of years ago, limestone rocks. And um, something we have a lot of experience with, but we couldn't, it wouldn't have grow naturally. Corals and shells could make limestone shells. We didn't know how to do that until Wolf discovered how to do that, making electricity. So when he began doing that for making materials, um, he began that in the 1970s. In the 1980s, I asked him to come to Jamaica to work with me, applying it towards growing corals. And that's when we began applying this technology towards ecosystem restoration. So what we found is that we were able to restore coral reefs and since the first projects that we did in Jamaica in the 1980s, we've done more than 400 projects in more than 40 countries all around the world. I'll show you only a few examples. The critical thing about BioRock technologies is really very remarkable for a lot of reasons. It creates the ideal biophysical conditions that all forms of life use to make their own biochemical energy. All the metabolism, all the energy for growth, reproduction, resisting stress, all of that comes from the electrical field between the inside and the outside of the cell. Organisms have to spend a lot of their energy maintaining that gradient. If it collapses, they die, so they have to use about a third or a half their energy maintaining that gradient. We're basically giving them that for free. So that means that corals and all forms of life around the bio-rock structures that we're growing, these limestone structures of any size or shape, the organisms all around those are settling faster growing faster, healing from damage faster. The surviving conditions would otherwise kill them. So as a result of this, and the branching much more rapidly and brighter colored, it's really quite remarkable. They're more resistant to environmental stresses, in particular high temperature, high sediment, and high mud. We've had up to 5,000% higher survival of corals on bio-rock reefs and surrounding reefs. This year, for example, in Indonesia, the bio-rock reefs that we had, that were properly maintained, had almost no coral mortality on them. In the nearby areas, we had bio-rock reefs that weren't maintained under power, and like the surrounding reefs, almost every single coral died. It was like a night and day difference, almost complete survival with the electrical field, almost complete death without it. So 
It's really a remarkable thing what our technology can do. We're able to keep whole ecosystems alive when they would die. So the result of that is a biorock we see swarming with huge clouds of fish all around them. I don't have time to show the video now here, but we do, I can't, we will, are posting that on the web. Um, if you compare them to the surrounding reefs, they just, they only have a few very unhappy looking disoriented fish swimming around desperate for food and shelter and all the corals are dead in the surrounding reefs. So it really makes a huge difference. So we can keep reefs alive when they would die because we can grow them much more rapidly. We're at the same time able to grow back entire new reefs and marine ecosystems and fisheries habitat very quickly in places where there has been no natural recovery at all, literally within months to years. And I will show you some examples of that. And in doing so, what we're creating is extremely complex ecosystems. We're not growing one species. We're growing everything that grows in that environment. We're not adding food. They're growing their own food. So we're generating complex ecosystems that have fish, corals, crabs, clams, worms, oysters, everything inside of them. So that makes superior habitat for marine organisms that allows us to restore fisheries, lobster populations, and fish populations very quickly. A lot of what we do is aimed at that, habitat restoration for fishing communities. So the result of this is we are able to, to maintain ecosystems that have been very badly stressed. We're able to restore damaged ecosystems and fisheries we're able to develop new forms of sustainable mariculture by growing organisms more rapidly that have economic value, and there's quite a number we work with there, with local fishermen. We're able to protect shorelines from erosion. I'm going to show you how we grow back beaches naturally at record rates. We create ecotourism attractions that people love to see, and you'll have to look at that, but in at least two different towns in, uh, in Indonesia, we've gone to towns that were Desperately poor fishing communities are the poorest villages on their islands. Now they're among the richest because we, in each of these places we have more than 100 bio-rock reefs just full of corals, swarming with fish. Tourists come by the thousands from all over the world to dive and snorkel and see these structures. It's created a boom in jobs. People have, you know, that it's completely transformed their economy from dire poverty to being actually quite profitable. So these are now worldwide ecotourism attractions and have built their economies. So in addition, we can produce building materials of many forms, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that here, but most of our structures are limestone that is solid rock. It's about three times harder than ordinary concrete. We're growing limestone rock out of the ocean. We do it slowly to get very hard material. And this is one of the first structures we built in Jamaica in the late 1980s. At this location here, the reef had died, it had been overgrown by the nutrients caused by sewage and caused algae to smother and kill the reef. There was hardly anything left alive. I found a couple of the last surviving corals transplanted onto this fire rock structure and they just simply proliferated like mad. One little piece about that big tripled in size in about three months. It was just, I'd never seen anything like that. So we were able to grow the stuff at record rates. Now, what we were growing is limestone rock. But we can also grow cements that are even harder than ordinary cement and that take, absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere, whereas ordinary cement production adds CO2 to the atmosphere. There's tremendous opportunities for this technology as well to produce building materials from the sea that are harder, stronger, and better for the environment. Okay, now here's one of our first reefs in Jamaica. As I say, we're growing corals in an area where all the surrounding corals have died from pollution. It was quite amazing. This is another one in Jamaica. These corals we were growing at nearly one centimeter a week. This is many, many times the record rates, but in an environment where the corals were dying from pollution. Another example, Elkhorn coral. This is a species now almost extinct, but we had it settle and grow. This is a four-year-old reef in Indonesia. We grew it in an area that was barren. You can see there was nothing but sand and rubble there. There was nothing to see. There were almost no fish almost no fish. We built a bio-rock structure there. We transplanted a few small pieces of coral. There's a huge fish population built up. In this area, there's more than 100 of these structures. So not only built up fish populations in the protected area, they spill over into the surrounding areas and the great increase of fisheries for all the surrounding villages. The surrounding villages want more and more of these projects to restore their fisheries wherever they can get them.
Another four-year-old bio rock reef in Indonesia. Again, we've got a cloud of fish around them. We can build them in any size or shape. And um, these are just a few examples. When we began that project, there was almost no live coral. In 1998, almost all the corals died from bleaching, from high temperatures. And you can see one partly live coral here, that's it. And this whole screen, everything was completely dead when we started laying the cables. This is the same place 10 years later. Now it's about 99% covered with live coral, just completely grown back. Everything in that area that had disappeared. The electrical field throughout this area stimulated coral settlement and growth and huge fish populations. So it's something that our method is the only method that does. It works, I say, with all forms of marine organisms, not only corals. <clears throat> so we find that we're able to get vastly greater growth rates. This means we can grow back coral reefs and oyster reefs wherever they used to be in the past. We're able, we've had up to 5,000% higher survival of corals on these structures. They're just growing much more healthy because of that electrical field. So they have ideal conditions for surviving conditions that otherwise would kill them. These are examples showing the settlement of, of corals on bio rock versus controls. Hundreds of times faster settlement. They're attracted to the electrical field. It shows the growth rate on bio rock versus control. They're growing anywhere from 2 to 15 times faster. These are different species of corals or oysters or other organisms at different locations under different conditions, but they basically all show the same thing. They get much higher survival. In many cases, we're getting complete survival where controls are all dying from many different forms of stress. So that is quite remarkable. And this shows how they make their own biochemical energy from the current. And that's what we're doing is very fundamental. We're stimulating the natural mechanism by which all forms of life make their energy. So it's, it's, you couldn't do, be stimulating the growth of anything at a more basic level. We're just feeding off the natural electrical fields that, that all forms of life need. <laughs> so, because of the physical and chemical process, we can grow solid limestone rock structures of absolutely any size or shape. And typically, we're producing material that's about three times harder than ordinary concrete. Now, everyone knows when you build steel structures in the sea, the steel's going to rust and corrode. You build a reinforced concrete bridge or a breakwater or a seawall in the ocean, what will happen is eventually that steel rusts. As it rusts, it expands. That cracks the concrete, more seawater gets in, and then it cracks and even quickly, more quickly. So every marine construction material, especially using reinforced concrete, is strong when you put it in the water, and it deteriorates immediately from that point on until it crumbles, collapses, and falls apart. Biorock produces a very different sort of material. We're producing materials that are actually growing in the water. They're getting bigger with age. They're getting stronger with age the only marine construction material that actually gets stronger with age, and moreover, they repair themselves. They heal themselves with damage. I'll show you that in a minute. And furthermore, they also reverse ocean acidification on a very small local scale. They're making, they're making it less acid. That's how we grow limestone out of seawater. The process itself reverses ocean acidification in a small scale. This shows two-year-old bio-rock material. These are, as I say, three times harder than concrete. We've grown them over steel bars in the Maldives in about two years. And this one here, covered with oysters, is from Louisiana. The oysters grew to adult size in months. They settled by themselves and grew right on it. This is a bio-rock structure in Indonesia that was hit by a boat that broke loose from a mooring, shipwrecked right onto our structure, smashed the thing, the thing open. And here you see a close-up of the broken limestone rock we grow over the steel framework. That steel framework at this point had been 12 years in the ocean and there's no rusting on it at all. It's completely protected from rusting by the electrical current. You can see that there. Then a year later, we've grown back material. We've healed itself. So this is the only material that repairs itself when it's damaged. It has very different properties. Furthermore, we build reefs. We don't build solid breakwaters that reflect waves. Every structure that's made that reflects waves concentrates all the force of the energy in front. It washes away all the sand and sediment and mud in front of the structure. Then it washes away the sand and mud underneath. And then the structure inevitably is going to 
collapse, crumble, and fall apart. And that's because the structure itself causes erosion. We build structures like this that are like coral reefs or open frameworks. The waves go through. They don't reflect the waves at all. Because the process that causes erosion, we don't create here. The waves dissipate energy through refraction passing through the structure. And as a result, sand builds up all around them. These are bio-rock reefs in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Here's a human being here for scale. And this is a few days before two worst hurricanes in the history of the Turks and Caicos Islands that hit three days apart and damaged or destroyed 80% of the buildings on the island. We had almost no damage to our reefs. The corals that we'd put on were rescued from the cruise ship port where they were being killed by the sediments that were stirred up by the propellers of cruise ships. We had only been there a few weeks and we lost very few of them. Solid concrete blocks, like those you see in the center, Half of those were carried away by the waves, but not our structure. And this structure wasn't even welded together. It was hand tied with wire and sitting under its own weight on the bottom. Sand built up around it where sea walls suffered erosion. So what we do is we grow, accumulate sand under very different principles than the standard methods. I'll show you some examples now. This is in the Maldives in 1997. The beach had completely washed away. Every island in the Maldives has severe erosion like this. Here they were piling sandbags to prevent the trees falling to the sea and buildings were about to collapse. Beach was gone. At this location, we grew a bio-rock reef right in front of that eroding beach. We transplanted corals onto it. And what that did, very rapidly, is it grew a new beach back. When we began this project, this building was about to collapse into the sea. There were sandbags in front, and the management of the hotel said there was no way that they could save that building. They were going to lose it, they were going to have to tear it down. There was no way. We grew that beach back right in front of them very quickly, simply by growing a reef in front of this beach. And that beach has been stable now for more than 15 years. That's the new beach we grew here. The dark line in front is a bio-rock reef. The building that was about to collapse is here, and the first picture with the cliff in the sand was over here. We grew the beach back really completely, very rapidly, and the amount of electricity we used for this bio-rock reef was about one air conditioner worth of electricity. It was extremely effective. So we did that in 1997. In 1998, the reef that was in front had about 99% mortality of corals from bleaching and high temperature. On our reef, most of the corals survived. And that meant that all the fish moved out of the dead reef into the bio-rock reef. And for about 10 years, this is the only resort in the Maldives that had a natural beach and that had a reef full of corals and fish right in front of their beach that tourists could swim on. So this shows that reef about 15 years later. The sand, there was no sand when we began. This was. These structures were built on top of bare rock. And the sand accumulated afterwards on the beach and under the reef, and that's that beach 15 years later. My Maldivian colleague was washed off this island by the tsunami in 2004 and had to swim back. But there was no damage to either the beach or our reef. Here's another example in Indonesia. Here's a beach that's completely washed away. The picture at high tide, you can see these trees are falling down and these are cement bags that are piling up all along the shore to prevent the buildings from falling in. There we built bio-rock anti-wave structures. They're shaped like upside down waves. That's what we call them anti-waves. This is a low tide. Here there's a big tidal range and the idea was to protect the shore. They're very strong waves and very strong currents, and you can see out on the reef flat here, there's no, no sand at all piling up. So, and over here, the trees were falling to the sea, and there was a little narrow beach right along the edge. Within eight months on Google Earth, you could see the growth of the beach. Our structures are located in front of the beach, and behind them, the beach is already growing. You can actually see it from satellite images within eight months. There's another location on that same island. This, this, this hotel here had a seawall. That seawall was about to fall into the sea. They'd built it one year before, and already 
the seawall had caused erosion of all the sand in front, and it caused the erosion of a cavity underneath the wall that was about to make it collapse. So we grew bio rock reefs in front of that structure here, and within eight months, again, on Google Earth, you could see the growth of the beach in front. After one year after we built the structure, that, that seawall, the sand had built up again in front of the seawall, whereas before it had been exposed and undermined and about to fall down. So that whole new beach we grew back that hadn't been there in one year. If you now turn around and look behind you at this spot, that's next door. The trees falling in the sea, the road used to run along here, that's gone. It's fallen into the water. If we now look behind the tree that's fallen down there, what you see is a neighbor's seawall, and that was built one year before at the same time as the seawall that we saved. This was built at the same time, one year before it's already collapsed and fallen into the sea. So what we do is something totally different. We, in growing reefs, we, we grow beaches back naturally, where seawalls do the opposite. They cause erosion. This is another example in Indonesia. Here you see these, these are the bases of a building that's about to fall into the water. There's a beach is washed away, there's a cliff in the sand, and these are the remnants of a building that was, was once well in land and is now, they're, they're feel they're going to have to remove it. Here, here's that building, you can see why they're about to move it. This was in December of last year, and then we look along the beach here, trees that had collapsed into the sea because of the severe erosion of the beach. So the whole length of the beach with all these problems here. And these, these are from last December. In January, we built bio rock reefs. January of this year, 2016, we built a whole bunch of bio rock reefs in front of these eroding beaches here. And within months, the beach grew back. This is in August of this year, but actually 80% of this growth happened by April. Structures were put in in July, and by April, the beach had almost completely grown back. That's a building that was falling into the sea on the right, and that's a tree that had collapsed into the sea. And so it's astonishingly quick. What we've done is we've grown a beach back naturally, literally in months. We don't know of any other place in the world where that's been done. And simply we've grown reefs in front of them that are very simple. Uh, over here, we're looking now from the new beach we grew back and uh, we made the beach about one and a half meters higher and about 10 meters wider this year. And then off here you can see the tops of those reefs exposed at low tide. They're underwater at high tide. And um, they're a little too shallow to grow corals on top of them. But when we look at them underwater, we're getting prolific growth of seagrass all around them. Fish are feeding all around them. Sea urchins and other things are habituating around them. Uh, we get baby corals that spring up all around the base. These are little small corals all over the place, and they're growing like mad. Barnacles are settling all over in the rocks, and oysters and mussels are starting to follow them. So we're already creating a whole rich ecosystem here at the same time that we're growing the beach back naturally very quickly and for much less cost than a seawall would have cost that would have not had that effect. Here's another example of what we do. Uh, that's shore protection. Worldwide, we're losing almost all our beaches to erosion. We can grow back our beaches naturally by growing back marine ecosystems and fisheries habitat in front of them for much less cost than seawalls that don't work. Here in Vanuatu, now we're talking about community-based fisheries habitat restoration. This is a subsistence fishing village. They live off the fish they got from the reef in front of their village. They're village was destroyed in 1943 by the U.S. Navy. It was dredged up and turned into an airport landing strip during the Second World War, and it's never recovered. So in this village here, we're working with the village to build structures to put into the sea to restore their fisheries and coral reef habitat. And kids really get into it. The whole community is really into it. Here are the kids, um, the structures they've helped build, take them into the water, putting it down on the bottom. Uh, here we're adding corals and attaching them. So we're really trying to, trying to work with the whole community to bring back their fisheries and develop uh, mariculture of the species they most desire, like giant clams and lobsters. So that creates a whole new paradigm for mariculture. It's very different. Now, what we're doing is only a short and medium term solution. We've got to control the nutrients and the sewage that are killing the sea at the same time. There's only one place in the world where that's ever been done, and that's, that's one bay in Jamaica 
where I got all the nutrients recycled on land before they went into the sea. And once we kept the nutrients out, the algae simply starved and died back very quickly. So that's the only way we know that works. It needs to be done almost every place too. That's, that's, as far as I know, no other place in the world has ever eliminated weedy algae long term except for that one case. So we have to do that. But the thing with biorock is that we can grow corals in polluted areas and areas that are too hot, but there are going to be limits. We've got to reduce the stresses to reefs in the long run. We have a short-term and medium-term solution only because global warming gets out of control, we've got to reduce global temperatures. So in the long run, it is essential that all countries, rich countries, poor countries, support efforts at the United Nations Climate Change Convention to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. It's not enough to reduce emissions to the atmosphere. That will cause runaway global climate change to continue for thousands or even millions of years. We've got to do what we call geotherapy, removing the excess CO2 from the atmosphere. The French government have been the first to call for that. In December in 2015, they called for increasing soil carbon by 0.4% a year with the idea of stabilizing CO2 at the present level. It needs to be much more ambitious. We need to lower it 40% to safe levels. I'll show you how and why in a minute. But it was the first step. And we need to do that because if we don't remove the excess CO2 from the atmosphere and reduce global warming, in the long run, we won't be able to save coral reefs from extinction from global warming. So Biorock is, is only an intermediate step. But we have to reduce CO2 at safe levels in order to prevent the large-scale extinction of these reefs, low-lying islands, and the billions of people who live along low-lying coasts. This diagram shows how serious it is, how much more serious it is than any policymaker realizes. This is the ancient sea level in Jamaica from 125,000 years ago. This is the last time when global temperatures were about one to two degrees Celsius warmer than they are today. And that sea level is cut right into the notch here. The fossil corals below it that grew in sea level was there. And you can see today's sea level down here in the background in the cave. That's seven or eight meters lower than what it is today. In front of this fossil sea level is a dead coral reef. We think that almost all the corals died from high temperatures. The bottom of that reef is intact in position of growth, and the top part, every, all the corals are smashed and lying on their sides, smashed to pieces. So at this time, when sea level was seven or eight meters higher than today, when global temperatures are one or two degrees C warmer than they are today, there were hippopotamuses and crocodiles in London, England, and you can see their fossils in the British Museum of Natural History. Yet at that time, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere are 40% less than they are right now. Than they are right now. So if you look at this picture, this is a place where if you know what you're looking at, you can see the past, the present, and the future. Because right now, today, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere is 400 ppm. At this time, it was only 270 parts per million. So for today's level of CO2, the equilibrium sea level is way, way up this limestone cliff. Way, way up there. And that's what policymakers don't understand. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change models only include short-term predictions of the changes, not the long-term ones. It's a scientifically flawed mandate, and so they miss 90% or more of the impacts. If we look at the long-term climate record from the last million years or more of Antarctic ice core records, deep sea sediment core records, fossil coral reefs all around the world, <clears throat> we're able to look at that data and say, what should be the equilibrium temperature and sea level for today's CO2 of 400 parts per million? And what those data show quite clearly is that the temperature would be for today's level of CO2, once it reaches steady state with that level, which it has not yet, we have not yet begun to feel the effect, once it does, we're talking about a temperature that would be about 17 degrees C warmer than today's level, and a sea level that's about 23 meters higher than today's level, or 75 feet. 
So these are much bigger changes than anyone recognizes. People have been lulled into a false sense of complacency because what IPCC is reporting is what models say might happen in 5, 10, 20, or 100 years of a process that is not going to stop at 100 years. It's going to keep going and going and going for thousands and thousands of years in the future. Well, people have been very misled about the magnitude of what we have set in motion. We haven't felt the impacts yet. And the reason is, well, here we can take a look at some of the data here. This shows the Antarctic ice core data of temp global temperature, sea level, and CO2 for the last 800,000 years. And what you can see here is that as CO2, which is recorded in the ice cores, goes up, so does the temperature. Here's today's temperature, where we are now, okay? And that is equivalent to about 260 parts per million of CO2. Here's where we are now, 400 parts per million. That's today's CO2 level. That's equivalent if we extrapolate the data to a temperature increase of 17 degrees C above today's level. That's what that data shows. This shows sea level versus change in temperature. And again, here's today's level of, of, of where we are now. But for 400 parts per million, the sea level will be up here. This is 23 meters or 75 feet above today's level. That won't happen quickly. And what IPCC and everybody else has forgotten is something very, very fundamental. It's a huge error. Okay, and I'll show that to you in one second. But first of all, the point is that what the data shows is the safe level of CO2 for today's temperature in sea level is about 260 parts per million. That means we must reduce CO2 in the atmosphere by about 140 parts per million. Emissions reductions cannot do that. Only increased sinks can do that. And soils, as I will show you, are the only place where we can store excess carbon fast enough, quickly enough, in order to avoid catastrophic long-term runaway global warming impacts. And that's what we call geotherapy, the restoration of our planet's natural life support system. We've got to come to an accurate scientific diagnosis of the global biogeochemical problems that are underway in order to prescribe a course of therapy to restore the patient back to health. We've got a, a patient whose who's natural immune system, the natural physiological mechanisms by which the Earth regulates its climate, its temperature, its water levels, its biosphere, all of that has been severely compromised by what we've done. We've got to restore the patient to health. And this concept, this medical analogy, was developed by the late Richard Grantham back in the late 1980s. We held the first international conference on geotherapy in Lyon, France in 1990. At that conference, I gave the talk on stabilizing atmospheric CO2 at safe levels, including the material that I'm showing you here in this talk. And that led ultimately to the French proposal to try to increase the carbon in soils is the only place we can do that. This is what I call carbon trading that's effective. This shows the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. The green is a safe amount. The red is a dangerous excess. That's what we need to get rid of. That's what's too much. There's vegetation contains about as much carbon as the atmosphere. We have lost about half the vegetation. We've just cut down about half the forest and turned that into CO2. So if we take this dangerous excess and grow it back and increase it in the vegetation and then store that in the soil, then we can really do something because there's nearly five times more carbon in soil than there is in, in either the atmosphere or vegetation. Once again, for all the land that we've damaged or disturbed or degraded, that we've cut down the forest and converted it to agriculture or pastures or cities, we've lost about half the carbon in soil. So at the present time, nearly half the excess CO2 in the atmosphere came from 10,000 years of our cutting and burning down forests and degrading the land. And more than half of it came in the last 100 years from burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. So it shows how we've unbalanced it. But we can right this, this, this situation again by simply putting the carbon back in the ground where it came from. That's what we call the down-to-earth solution to global warming because we only need to increase the amount of carbon in soil 
by about 10% in order to get rid of the dangerous excess. And that will retain nutrients in the soil, it will make the land more productive, it will retain water in the soil, it will make the land more green. It will prevent us losing all the rain and the washing off in the runny season and then not having any water in the dry season. It will allow us to produce more food and have a richer environment. Nevertheless, at the present time in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Soils and restoration are not even mentioned in the treaty, even though soils have five times more carbon than the atmosphere. It's not included in the carbon trading or the carbon accounting. Completely missing. Rest restoration of environments is to draw down CO2 and store in the soil is not included. The whole framework convention on climate change has very serious flaws. It needs complete and accurate accounting of all greenhouse gas sources and sinks, in particular, it needs to reward the only solution that can withdraw CO2 in time to prevent the catastrophic effects of runaway change, and that is putting it back in the ground. <clears throat> so uh, we need more geotherapy to correct what we've done. Storing CO2 is the only place we can put it in time to prevent that change, because soil has, as I say, nearly five times more carbon than the atmosphere. So we don't need to add very much. If we look at the global carbon balance, originally what was on land was pretty much in balance, but we've disturbed it by cutting down the forest. What was in the ocean was pretty much in balance, but again we've disturbed that. But this huge pool of soil organic carbon that we've been burning up and turning into CO2, now we need to start storing carbon in the ground. It's our only real solution. Storing it in the ocean is not a solution because the ocean stores very little carbon. I'll come back to that a little later. But the, the only way we could make the ocean into a serious carbon sink is to turn it into a dead zone. It's to drive out the oxygen and make it a dead, stinking mess where everything falls into it and rots without decomposing. Then it would be a carbon sink. So to, to, killing it would be the only way to make it um, absorb carbon on a serious scale. And that's not acceptable. We believe land is the only place where we can do it by restoring the land, by recycling the carbon into more vegetation and more carbon in the soil, not by pumping it underground as some people are proposing. We're talking about recycling, we're talking about re-stimulating the natural recycling mechanisms by which our planet has always regulated its climate and its temperature and our planetary life support systems. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of methods that have been developed now to put CO2 back into the ground. And these greatly increase soil fertility, they greatly increase the amount of water the soil holds, and so that means that we can have much more productive agriculture and forestry while removing carbon from the soil. Now, the principles of this were actually developed by Amazonian Indians in ancient days, and now we can do this at the same time we produce these materials, we can produce carbon negative energy energy that removes CO2 from the atmosphere. This is Terra Preta do Indio. This is the black earth of the Indians in the Amazon. And they found out how to turn the poorest soils in the world into the richest soils in the world. These are black soils because they're 10 to 50 percent charcoal by weight. And these Indians, in ancient days, they produced charcoal, they put it into the ground, they added fish bones of fish and turtles and manatees that they grew in the river, to provide the calcium and the phosphorus and the other missing elements. And they made soil that's so rich that now you, people have grown crops for 500 years with no fertilizer on it that rich. The charcoal isn't a fertilizer by itself. What it does, it retains the nutrients, it retains the water. So you have to add that. And so what we do now with that is we add rock powders. The rock powders provide all the minerals that the plants need except for nitrogen, which you have to provide from compost by mixing compost and rock powders and biochar, which is what we now call terra preta, we could create incredibly rich soils in any habitat from the local biomass that was there. We can use the weeds, the invasive weeds that are killing the environment and taking over, turn those into biochar and then produce fruit trees, for example, by producing biochar there. Now we can, what the Indians couldn't do in ancient times, now we can trap all the energy, all the heat, all the gaseous fuels, all the liquid fuels. At the same time, we can make heat, we can make electricity, we can make fuels that we can burn, 
And these fuels are carbon negative because by making them, we're actually removing CO2 from the atmosphere and burying it in the ground as Terra Preta and making the land rich again. These are techniques that can be done in any environment. So large-scale environmental restoration is the best way to stabilize CO2 at safe levels. It's the only real option we have. And we need to do it very, very quickly. We know how to do it. The mechanisms have been worked out. That people have done this in every ecosystem, in every habitat, in every soil type. Uh, it works. We just need a grassroots revolution, of an underground movement of people restoring the environment everywhere. But at the present time, as I repeat, these are not policies. They're not including in the climate change treaty. You can't get credits for environmental restoration or for putting carbon in the ground. So the whole treaty needs to be addressed. The treaty, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as it now stands, is riddled with scientific errors. It misses major fluxes, confuses net and gross fluxes. It can't meet its own goals of stabilizing climate at safe levels without having complete accounting of all greenhouse gas sources and six. This was in the original treaty, but was removed for political reasons because governments did not want to have to account for or have to solve the problem. That needs to be changed. The French government proposed in December in 2015 increasing soil carbon by 0.4% a year. That's aimed only at stabilizing it at present levels, not by bringing down the excess. So it needs to be strengthened. But that received support from all the French-speaking countries and from many EU countries, except that it became a voluntary proposal. The French had proposed as an obligatory proposal, and it was clear that the Americans, the Russians, and the Arab oil countries were completely opposed, would not allow agreement. So the French withdrew the proposal and made it voluntary. It needs to be made much stronger than that. Now, I'm here in Oxford University in giving this talk because I happen to be here for a meeting of the Commonwealth Secretariat beginning in London tomorrow. And that's the Commonwealth Secretariat is the association of 52 countries. It's essentially all the English-speaking countries in the world except for the United States. It contains 2.5 billion people. That's one-third of the planet's population. And the meeting is, that's going to be the next two days here is a Commonwealth Secretariat meeting on reversing, on, on regenerative development for reversing climate change. That's the title of the meeting. What it means is that these 52 countries with one third of the Earth's population are planning to announce very serious steps next June at a meeting to be promoting large scale regenerative development to reverse global warming. It's the first sign of hope we've seen. Combined with the French proposal, um, the French, that's a significant portion of Europe's population. China has recently committed to large-scale soil restoration as well. We're not sure yet how far that will go, but they've actually started serious carbon accounting at the same time. So with that, with the Commonwealth Secretariat, with all, all the, basically all the English-speaking countries except the U.S., with all the French-speaking countries, and with China, we think we're finally getting the political ball rolling to the point that the majority of Earth's population is now recognizing that without restoring ecosystems and soil carbon, we can't prevent climate change. Eventually, I think, the Americans, the Russians, and the Arabs are going to have to join the rest of the world. It may take them a long time, but I think we're finally seeing some momentum towards that, and we have to keep the pressure on all the time in order to see that result. So, as I repeat, Large-scale environmental restoration is the only way we can reduce CO2 in time in order to protect coral reefs, low-lying countries, and low-lying coasts. In order to do so, to save coral reefs, we have to greatly enhance the soil fertility on in forests, agricultural lands, grasslands, pastures. We need to restore the graded areas that we've ruined, increase their soil water holding capacity, and providing at the same time storing carbon and generating renewable carbon negative energy that's biomass based in these areas. And that's our solution to solving global warming and to saving reefs. So as we cannot save reefs without saving the entire planet. Thank you.